Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you're new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Apple, Spotify, or Google, please leave a five-star rating. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. Uphold is one of the great exchanges out there. I've been using them since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges for liquidity. They have 10 plus million users, 200 plus cryptocurrencies, and you can also trade equities and precious metals on Uphold, and they're available in 150 countries. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the link in the description. All right, my friends, uh, over the past couple of days, you may have noticed I did not post any content, and that's because I was traveling. I was down in Miami at the Proppy Web3 and Real Estate Summit. It was a great time, great weather, great people. Uh, I spoke on a panel with Michael Arrington and Sidney Powell. Many of you know Michael Arrington, founder of Arrington XRP Capital, also the founder of TechCrunch, uh, also Sidney Powell. He's the founder of Maple Finance. So we spoke on a panel, talked about DeFi, NFTs, crypto, real estate on the blockchain, and much more. Well, let's jump into the news, my friends. Let's talk about Visa. We got big news here. Visa could launch its own crypto wallet according to two trademark applications. <laughs> Do you see what's happening here, guys? When, once again, bear market, crypto winter, people are afraid, recession, inflation, Fed, all these big players are building. Visa, MasterCard, BlackRock, BNY Mellon, you name it. They're all setting up shop. They're filing for patents, trademarks. They're acquiring companies. They're forming partnerships. They're integrating crypto. So it, it should come as no surprise. Just last week, we talked about MasterCard partnering with Paxos to offer banks the ability to, uh, to offer crypto to their clients. So the infrastructure is being built out here. And another trademark news, which we covered earlier in the week, Western Union also did some recent trademark filings, and they're looking to launch their own token. They're looking to launch a, a, a cryptocurrency exchange. So all signs point to building and adoption of crypto. Now, big news in the SEC Ripple lawsuit. Jake Traversky of the Blockchain Association announced today that the Blockchain Association has filed an amicus brief in the SEC's case against Ripple. In short, the SEC is wrong on the law and its pattern of regulation by enforcement is harmful to both U.S. crypto companies and the investors that it's meant to protect. The amicus briefs are raining down on the SEC. They are in amicus brief hell right now. <laughs> Guys, we got the Blockchain Association. We got the Chamber of Digital Commerce, plus a ton of other companies that are using XRP, two of which I'm going to talk about in a new one that's actually entering in. And you have the Grayscale amicus briefs as well. So it's Grayscale suing the SEC for not approving a Bitcoin spot ETF. So I love that the entire industry is on the offensive here against the SEC, which is going around doing regulation by enforcement, harming innovation. They're leaving the scammers, right? They're not actually going after the Celsius networks and, and the folks who really hurt the market. They're going after companies that are actually doing great things. So I think it's clear their agenda, and that is to slow crypto down. It is not to protect retail investors, which it shows the SEC has fallen far from their core values. Now, uh, Judge Torres, of course, one of the judges in the SEC Ripple lawsuit, uh, she has uh, granted the uh, two uh, additional amicus briefs in support of Ripple. So those are the uh, ICANN and the Spendabits uh, amicus briefs. So Judge Torres has green-lighted another two guys. And then we also have news of a new one. So Investor uh, Choice Advocates Network, ICANN, has formally filed its amicus brief in support of Ripple. So we're just seeing... Um, just once again, tons of amicus briefs coming in, support for Ripple, also Grayscale. I think there's more on the Ripple side, of course, and uh, the SEC is not in a good spot. Now, I, I think you got to read between the lines here. The fact that these folks, these uh, government associations, these blockchain associations, crypto associations, and advocacy groups are doing this shows they see the writing on the wall. The SEC is not in the on the winning side here. I believe, like I've been saying for years, since this lawsuit was filed, Ripple is going to win. 
I do believe they're going to have to pay a fine for maybe the early days of how they, uh, uh, you know, sold XRP. But XRP today and future XRP sales will not be securities. XRP on the secondary market will not be securities. That's what I think is coming. And we're just seeing a lot of folks in the industry rallying behind Ripple now because I think people see what's at hand. You, we need Ripple to win for the entire market because Gensler's going after everything. NFTs, Kim Kardashian, <laughs> you name it, right? He's going after everything. So great news here. And uh, this should make you excited. Um, Ripple released their quarterly XRP reports. And uh, something interesting, uh, Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, uh, he tweeted out, below 50%, a huge milestone. For 10 years, Ripple has focused on using XRP and the XRPL within our products for its speed, security, and scalability for movement of value. As more customers use XRP in their payment flows, it's clear there is real utility here. So the takeaway here is that Ripple now holds less than 50% of the XRP supply. So more XRP is out in the market, more um, companies and, and institutions around the globe are using XRP. So I like that. I like that they control less of it. Now, don't get me wrong. There's FUD out there, people saying, oh, you know, they control the escrow and so forth, but uh, they have it in a decentralized way and they also provide transparency. So it's not like they have it in the back room and you don't know what's happening. They're transparent. They release the quarter, quarterly reports, which I think is, is great. And I wish more companies and crypto projects would do that. Now, uh, many of you know of Elon's uh, Twitter takeover. <laughs> he has, of course, officially acquired uh, Twitter. Well, Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange, they have invested $500 million in Elon's uh, Twitter takeover. And I think with the recent news we've been seeing, like Twitter's working on a wallet prototype that, that supports crypto deposit and withdrawal. And the fact that uh, Twitter will allow NFTs to be directly displayed on tweets, uh, making it easier to buy and sell NFTs, I think Twitter is going to become a big, big crypto hub. Um, it will be probably the the most crypto friendly social platform. And obviously, we know Elon is big on crypto. He holds Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum, Tesla, ha and SpaceX both have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. We know Jack Dorsey. He's, he left a legacy with Twitter where, you know, there was already integration starting and a lot of different things. So it wouldn't surprise me if Twitter, they eventually uh, add Bitcoin to their balance sheet, but also launch a, a bunch of new features that are uh, crypto related on the platform. So while there's other things to discuss, I know there's a lot of drama behind the Elon acquisition. There's some political thing, free speech things. Uh, you know, this is not, this is a crypto podcast. I'm not going to get into that, but I'm, I'm going to give you the crypto angle. And I, you can imagine what's going to happen. And Elon's going to do some cool things here from a crypto perspective, at least. Finally, Hong Kong to make retail crypto trading legal. According to a report, the city is looking to reestablish its reputation as a global financial hub. Everybody that had a uh, negative stance that tried to ban crypto will eventually have to uh, resend, will have to reverse those bans and so forth. Why? This is going to be part of their GDP, crypto, blockchain, and so forth. This is going to be part of the economy, driving growth and creating jobs. And if they ban crypto, they're writing a death sentence to their economy. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight or in a few weeks or a month, but as this asset class continues to grow and everything moves to the blockchain, if they don't enable innovation and uh, become you know, more friendly to crypto, their, their economy is going to hurt. And they, we've seen the technology is able to easily move to another country that has the regulations that, that is friendly and has you know, uh, rules uh, that are friendly to crypto. So you know, as usual, as we've talked about over the years, they're going to tax it. They're going to legalize it and regulate it and tax it and make their money off of it. But they're not going to kill it and they're not going to ban it. And I believe we will eventually see China. And we know China, they, they did the big ban, right? They will reverse, mark it, book it. It's coming. They're going to have to reverse because their economy is going to suffer as a result. But we're heading into a whole new spectrum when it comes to the economy and how things are going to work. 
So that's the news, my friends. Let me know what you think. Leave your thoughts and comments below. Hit the thumbs up button, share this video, and I'll talk to you all later.